today's episode, we'll be unpacking Oculus history to reveal one shortcoming as well as the DIY solution to overcome it. So keep watching as we use science, stock footage, and this guy to make the ultimate wireless charger. So to really understand this project, first I gotta give you a little background. See, I've been a longtime supporter and fan of Oculus, uh, going back almost to the very beginning. On September 26th of 2012, Oculus made their first development kit, the DK1, available to the development community. With the first rollout of the device being around March 29th of 2013 at around $300. And while it had a really wide field of view, it had a really bad screen door effect. That means it looked like you were basically looking through a screen door, a lot of pixels that you could see. Not to mention it covered a majority of your face. Now I didn't own the first development kit and the reason was because I knew that the DK2, the second development kit, was about to be released. In fact, I was one of the first to get my development kit on July 24th of 2014 for about $350. And the DK2 did have a much better and faster AMOLED panel, the same one used in Galaxy Note phones. It was slightly lighter and it came with two lenses that you could put in in the case that you wore glasses. But the DK2 was still limited by this cable as well as the sensor that he used. In this case, there was just one camera used for reading the front-facing IR. And so for that reason, it was really better for seated games. Now, at this time, the Oculus was really only for developers. And in order to be able to purchase or to use the Oculus, you actually had to register as a developer. And that included submitting a project that you plan to work on. Now on the upside, that meant that you also got to be a part of a forum of people that were freely sharing their programs and their apps. So you got to try out things well before they'd be actually released to the public and it was free. Now before you ask, yes, I actually had a project that I submitted. Mine was for an EEG based controller, basically trying to control programs using your mind. You see, neurons produce a form of electrical activity which can be measured in waves and converted into data that then can be used to control things like programs and games. And this is a new technology. I mean, we've had uh, neurofeedback types of controllers for some time as well as programs that you could use. But the, the big thing about this was we hadn't tried it before with something else strapped to your face. And the problem with this is that it's not just your neurons that release electrical signals, so do your muscles. And so we get something called EMG, which can cause artifact, which, which interferes with some of the data that we would need in order to make that controller really work well. And so typically, you have to take away some of that artifact. And I found that it was just too difficult to do that when I had a giant thing strapped to my face. So I gave up the project. I. Uh, <laughs> I know that there's other people out there now trying to do the same thing, and I'd really be interested to know how they're compensating for that. But it didn't matter because I had an Oculus now, and in 2016, Leap Motion made a controller which I found to be way more interesting. See, the Leap Motion could already track your hands and sense them, and a lot of the developers started to use it to have hand controllers as well without having to use any type of uh, physical controller. And so eventually, they started strapping them onto the front of the Oculus. And that was good because even when the Vive came around, I was still able to play a lot of the Steam-based games using a uh, tweak of that Leap controller. Now there was supposed to be a commercial version of the Oculus that was gonna come out that had hand controllers similar to the Vive, as well as two towers. This would allow people to actually stand up, move around and, and interact more realistically uh, with their environment. However, in March 28th of 2016, when they released the CB1, they still didn't have any touch controller support yet, and there was only one tower. There was a sort of touch remote, which you could use for certain types of media. But if you wanted to be able to control your games, you still had to use either the Xbox controller or transfer over that lead motion like I did in order to be able to emulate some of those Vive controllers. Because it was almost a year before they would release the touch controllers as well as the second tower and this holder for Rock Band that you would put on your compatible guitar and stick the controller into. The only personal problem that I had with the CV1 was it felt like the controllers were always going dead and you never really knew how much juice was in those controllers. 
they wouldn't die at the same time either. It seems like there would always be one that just stopped working and then you'd have to re-register it and it was a whole thing. But don't get me wrong, it was totally worth it. it. You didn't notice that screen door effect as much anymore. It was much brighter, it was lighter, and it didn't use up so much space. The tether was longer and more comfortable, and you have these built-in surround sound headphones, uh, which <laughs> were a slight problem, particularly from that left side. The connectors seemed to have a problem that would occur around the back of the strap and uh, would start to have sound problems and the earphone would also come undone. After leaving Oculus, designer Palmer Lucky actually felt bad enough that he invested his own money to purchase repair kits which he gave away for free. So that was, that was pretty neat. Of course, another complaint that people still had at that time was that you also were limited by the length of the cable and the size of your room. I mean, you couldn't just walk around freely. You had to stay in sight of those towers. So Oculus tried to release more portable headsets. Uh, they even made a phone-based headset with the help of Samsung, complete with the form of a touch controller. But they just didn't have the processing power or ability to do what the CB1 did. So it still was the best experience for the price. At least until May 21st of 2019 with the release of the Quest. Unlike the CB1 and its predecessors, the Quest had more processing power. It could actually store games and could be used without towers or outside-in technology. Now the Quest could actually be charged as well, so it contained its own power. The problem was that the front of this unit was very heavy and people found that it was very noticeable as well. So they would compensate by putting battery packs or weights on the back in order to be able to hold up their head for extended periods of time. There's no longer headphones, now instead there's built-in speakers on the front of the headset which seemed to make sound just appear inside your head. Screen door effect is again improved to greater brightness, uh, better clarity, and this is the first time when players could literally just walk freely. You could even set it up to be able to use multiple rooms. You could take it on the go. But the apps for it tended to be a little lower quality than what people were used to when connected to their computers. Some of the heavier games would still require being connected. And there was another Oculus that was going to be released uh, that was going to be able to do that. Initially, Oculus said that you could buy an official cable which would connect to the Oculus and would allow you to access your games in the same way that you did with the CB1. But it was expensive, really expensive, but over time, Oculus did make it so that your charging cable could literally be used to play your games on your computer, and that was good. Again, my biggest gripe was there were still batteries inside these controllers, uh, and again, they would go dead, and there was no way to just charge them. You had to take out the batteries and charge them up and then put them back in or, or buy new batteries all the time, whereas the headset could be charged. Didn't make sense. Then in October 13th of 2020, they released the Quest 2. This headset actually uh, has improved graphics, better sound, a larger hard drive, the ability to be charged for longer, this specialized head strap so that it's more comfortable on the head with less weight in the front, and it easily connects to your computer so you can play all your games, which this is a good time for me to mention why is it that I'm so into the Oculus when there's so many other types of headsets that are out there. And the reason for that is that while there was other headsets that were out there like the Vive or the PlayStation headset, they were limited to certain stores, uh, certain libraries. So the PlayStation, for example, could only play PlayStation games. The Vive would play Steam-based and third-party apps, but couldn't access the Oculus Store. The Oculus was the only one that could access the Oculus Store plus third-party apps, plus the Steam apps that I wanted to play. And generally speaking, I've, I've actually enjoyed it more. I'm sure you, you might have a different opinion. If you do, leave it in the comments below. But in general, it's a device that keeps on getting better. Now, I can't speak to the future. Uh, Facebook actually purchased Oculus way back in 2014 with some kind of grand plan. And we do know that any of the newer customers or headsets, you're going to have to actually register in Facebook. We also know that there's a Quest Pro that's coming out that I don't know what it's going to have that's going to be different. But I can say this, once again, the one gripe that I have 
is that these controllers have batteries. When everything else can be charged, uh, these have standard batteries and they, they don't go out at the same time and uh, seem to lead to disconnections and ah, uh, I just am tired of it. So it seemed to me that there was only one thing that could improve things. I can't believe my controllers died mid-game. Now I'll never make friends. I can't believe I forgot to charge my tablet. Now how am I going to binge watch Cake Wars? Why does no one include charging bricks with their smartphones anymore? Do I look like the kind of guy that has USB ports in his walls? There's, There's gotta, gotta be a better way. way. Well now there is. Introducing the charged charger for charging things. What it does is in the name. No need to plug in non-necessary cables. Just lay down your controllers and headset and you'll see them charging right away. You can charge your phone, tablet, smartwatch, earbuds, and so much more. So say goodbye to this, this, and this. Now anyone can charge their devices, even grandma and grandpa. Stay charged. Not a real advertisement, not for sale anywhere, no guarantee. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Now, wireless charging is nothing new. Uh, Tesla introduced magnetic resonant coupling over 100 years ago. This is the process of charging things through a magnetic field. And the only problem is that you have to have a transmitter and a receiver. And I thought about using some of those tiny pads uh, for being able to charge. And uh, the problem with those is that they're flat. They need to be flat and these are rounded. And so I didn't think that would work so well. Plus it would be very noticeable when you're trying to use the controllers. I'd already decided to use these USB based batteries for charging it. The only thing is I had to figure out a way to connect them and, and pretty quickly I decided since I was using USB anyways that I might as well use connectors like these that are magnetic. It was actually during this project that I decided to use the same technology for a Pip-Boy project that I was working on at the same time and came out last week. There's one end that is the USB plug and the other is a magnet that it snaps onto and once when it makes a connection it will charge whatever it's plugged into. This meant that all I had to do to charge my batteries was to stick the USB end in and then whenever the magnet made contact it would start charging. Now the problem with this is that it would also mean that I'd have to have a hole in the controller in order to be able to make that connection. And I'd need that hole to be right about here. Once I get the battery in there with the connector on it, I can't put on the cover. Uh, I, I don't have any way to be able to, to make it connect. So for that reason, I needed to drill a hole in that battery cover in order to be able to charge it. And of course I didn't want to drill into the originals. So I thought about 3D printing them or doing some other things and in the end I found out that buying spares, which comes with a lot of other parts from Oculus, was actually much cheaper. So I just purchased those spares. They'll feel more comfortable and, and less noticeable by doing that as well. So now I can put in the battery, slip on the cover, and then take my connector and stick that through the hole. And then I can connect it to my charger, just like so. Similarly, you can get a type C controller that's like this, uh, one that is rated for fast charging. Both ends need to be a type C in my case. And I can just push that magnetic end into the headset and I'm able to wear it without having anything connected and now all it has to do is come into close contact with the cable and it will connect and charge. Now, it was actually when I was most of the way through with this project in January when I realized that there was other products coming out that you could purchase which did the same thing. Uh, literally, these chargers that are now coming out for your Oculus are the same technology I just showed you. They were existing technology that you could already buy, but now they're trying to sell it and even have Kickstarter pages to fund them uh, to sell something that really you could do on your own. But the thing that they don't seem to have yet is a way of being able to see how much the devices are charged. It seems like you should be able to just lay down your controllers and have it show you how much it's being charged uh, or how dead they are. So another technology that are out there are these uh, USB chargers. Now this is the first one that I purchased. Now the only problem with this was that while I had plenty of USB connectors, it uh, wasn't as powerful as I needed it to be. Uh, 
It's uh, in fact known to be overpowered at times. And the screen was mounted to the motherboard, which I wanted to be able to move that screen for what I wanted to do with it. So for that reason, I bought this version right here, which I like a lot. And uh, it has five USB ports with one quick charge port. Now you can find a lot of these USB chargers that give you feedback on how much is being charged. The reason why I picked this one is because the display seemed to be much bigger or it was easier to see uh, what was going on with each individual device uh, because it wasn't too small. And so when you see it rotating around, it'll show you the number of the USB and then it will also show you the amount of charge that it's picking up on as well as the amount of draw. It even stops charging at capacity. So, so that's pretty cool. But how does it do that? Well, it's a lot like your phone being able to determine how much your battery needs to be charged. Most phones use a column counter to determine how much power is being used and then looks for averages to compare to the phone's capacity. This charger uses impedance tracking because a lithium ion cell has very specific impedance for each state of charge that it's in. So it can make an estimate on how much charge is left. And so that's how this device is able to show us how much it thinks the battery still has to be charged and can show us how much it's drawing as well as stop when it fills its reached capacity. Now as far as being able to more easily charge these devices, this is all that I need. The USB charger, a few cables uh, with magnetic ends and some rechargeable batteries. But I wanted this to be a little bit more cool. I, I wanted it to have a homey look to it. It's like something you'd get it from an Ikea store. So we went to Walmart to the uh, home section and I purchased one of these Better Homes and Gardens drawer organizer. It's about 15 inches by 6 inches and I got four of those. I also got some black foam boards, some black poster board. I also got some nuts and bolts and electric tape and uh, and I decided I wanted it to do more than just charge my Oculus. I decided I also wanted to get some of these Anchor uh, wireless chargers for being able to charge my phone. And another device that I'm going to use to make this a little bit more uh, smart. As well as this really cool vinyl that I'm going to use uh, to make some stickers. So now that I have all my materials, uh, let's get building. One thing about using bamboo products is that they can break and chip really easily, so when fastening them together, I use these rubber washers before tightening it. So one thing I got just before this project that I think is kind of cool is this Cause Tools uh, rotary cutter. And what it does is it is used for cutting holes or perfectly round holes in foam. So you just set this slider right here to the width that I want. And then I place it using this little rod here in the center for my center where I need it. And then as you turn it, it slowly lowers itself and cuts right through that foam. And then I've got a perfect hole right there. I'm gonna need several of those for this project. I'm going to use some hot glue and my circle cut foam to build up the area around the Alexa and the chargers. I use my phone tool to open up the charger. Detach the ribbon and remove the front face. And then I placed it inside the top of the charging pad for the Oculus. Then I retest the screen ribbon through a hole and glued the cables into place. And with that, I now have this base, which is able to not only charge my Oculus, my phones, and be able to play my favorite music, but it can also tell me how much charge each of those things has and if they're fully charged or not. But why stop there? I mean, really, why not go further? You could charge your electric lawnmower with it or, or your car. 
What is your charger gonna do? Let us know in the comments below. Also make sure that you like, subscribe, click that reminder button so you know what else we have coming out and stay tuned for more of your Geek Fix.